Today's agenda involves some introductions and an ice breaking prompt. And although I've described this as a poll in the green circle on the slide, you can simply use the chat function to answer these polls as we go through today's presentation. There are three moments where I'm going, I'm going to prompt you like this. And uh, the last one will open up our discussion more generally. But as John said, feel free to throw out a question to me uh, in the chat at any time during this presentation. I want to spend a little bit of time after introductions on reasons to encourage participation and then participating and leading with questions, our terminology and the assignments timing, and, and those last two will be very quick. And then we'll spend a little more time talking about what makes a good question. And I'll show you some sample prompts from my own syllabus from a course that I taught in, uh, well, I taught two courses that use the assignment, but one in particular that I taught in this past term. Then I'll show you some student samples and they're anonymous. So um, I don't think there's any ethical reason why not to use these questions. And finally, um, there will be further discussion or questions from you. So um, let's begin with poll number one. If you want to start answering this in the chat, that's great. And um, while that's happening, I'll move on to introductions and say a little bit more about my background and where I'm coming from here to help contextualize what I'm saying. So feel free to answer this question. What one topic related to questioning interests you the most? What one topic related to questioning interests you the most? You can put that in the chat if you'd like. All right, let's move on to introductions. And that might be an occasion too for you to use um, a question here. As John said, I'm Joel Shea from the Department of English, and um, I am the author or, or co-author of three different books. Um, one called The Metaphor of Celebrity, one called The American Western in Canadian Literature, and one, a co-edited collection that's, uh, I hope, coming out later this year called The Contemporary Leonard Cohen. So it's all about literature for me, and um, it's interesting that one of the novels that I'm going to mention a little later today uh, involves a um, a narrator that spends so much time questioning. So I'm even noticing it in the literature that I'm looking at. I, I also want to say that I'm formerly a consultant at the University of Saskatchewan's Instructional Design Office. That office is parallel to CITL here at Memorial University. And when I was there working at um, the Instructional Design Office, I learned a lot about teaching. Of course, I didn't have any training in teaching as somebody who did a master's degree and, and later a PhD in English literature. Um, so I didn't have any training, but I learned so much from working with other in instructional design experts. And in our little office, we had uh, a small library of resources, books and pamphlets and films that were all intended to help people with their teaching. and. One book really struck me. It was a book by Walter L. Bateman called Open to Question, The Art of Teaching and Learning by Inquiry. This book is now, you know, 30 or 40 years old. Um, but it's, uh, doesn't, doesn't, I don't think it matters that it's an old book. Um, what's important is that this Bateman, he was a biologist, um, and he was trying to figure out how to engage his students on a day-to-day -day basis in being curious. And, and he wanted to find out ways of opening up questioning in his own classroom, in his lab, in his field work. And uh, one of the reasons why I remember this book so well is because we had a professor from one of the colleges who came into our office one day and uh, I recommended this book. And she opened it up, looked at it briefly, slammed it closed and put it back on the shelf and said, this book is too self-indulgent. And I, I, I said, well, what's that? What does that mean? What, why, why don't you like that? Uh, and she said, well, it's just about um, what this 
professor's personal experience was and how this affected students' personal experiences. And that's just not objective enough for, for me. And I, I remembered this moment because uh, I had the impression that this professor didn't care what her students were thinking or what they were feeling and, and was in, <laughs> I guess, a noble search for this elusive truth and objective reality. Uh, which over the years have just become more and more suspicious about. So this book is way in the background of um, my reading about questions. Uh, and, and I suppose it's in the background of this assignment that I'm going to introduce to you today, which I hope will, you'll find practical and helpful. So I do have a question here in the chat from uh, Jim and um, because this is part of an introductory slide, and I've got a relatively small number here in this group today, 20 participants, uh, including a couple of co-hosts. I wonder if you could tell me in the chat um, where you're from, and maybe Jin, Jim, you could start by telling me what your field is or what your department is. And then I'll think about this question, which is a great question, how to reflect cultural and language differences in questions. Yeah, that's a great question, Jim. Jim's from the Nunavut Arctic College. Welcome. This is one of the big advantages of the virtual platforms is if you're really not in the same place, you can still connect. Uh, Jim, since you're asking this, um, Ah, the social service program. Okay. You know, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, your question's a big one and it reminds me since I'm invoking my early teaching career here with this book by Walter Bateman, it reminds me that one of the first places I ever taught was then called the Saskatchewan Indian Federated College. It's now the first nations university of Canada. But I taught there and taught an English literature and indigenous literature course there just after I graduated with my master's degree. And one of the problems that I realized um, with my teaching methods, which I had simply inherited from my own education, was that um, questions were like interrogations from a position of power. And that was a cultural and language difference. Um, I was speaking primarily to Indigenous students. For many, um, English was a second or third language. Cree or Diné, for example, would have been um, first languages or family languages for them. And so to have um, a person uh, like me, a white man standing in the front of a classroom, um, delivering lectures and asking questions, it, the questions were built into a power dynamic. And so, um, and, and there were questions at the time that you couldn't always prepare for. And um, that, I think, produced a chilling effect on uh, conversations that we could have in that classroom. I often think back to my early courses and the mistakes that I made, or, or maybe not mistakes, but the things I didn't know that I wish uh, uh, I could go back in time and, and teach myself. So, so yeah, um, to avoid those kinds of um, problems with cultural and language differences in questioning, you also might have to change the entire dynamic and delivery method for um, for your your own course, um, and you might need to think about how your own role as the instructor. Um, is a powerful role that might need to be uh, dialed back, right? So that other people feel more comfortable with the kinds of questions that you ask and the questions that they may also ask. Uh, Jasmine, thank you. You're from chemistry. Um, uh, and Jim, thank you for following up there with the uh, further information about um, your students. Yeah, um, let's see if I recognize any others here in the group. Oh, Karen is here. Um, and she is in the um, 
uh, the teaching and technology lab here on campus. Um, yeah. Naturally, the uh, naturally it is it is unreasonable to expect that everybody will have an answer to every question that you ask. And for that reason, I'm not going to demand that you tell me um, what department you're from or what field you're from. Though, thank you uh, to Jim and and Jasmine uh, and Jeff for doing that. I appreciate it. Uh, that's one of the other things about questioning that's really, really important is that um, when you realize that you're coming from a position of power and you're asking questions, um, you, you can't lean on that power too much and, and make demands. Uh, all you can really hope is that your question will be taken as a kind of suggestion, right? Uh, so we've got some chemistry, we've got some business admin, um, and we have uh, the Arctic College, which, uh, of course, will cover many different disciplines. And Karin, yeah, occasionally also teaches German. The reason I was asking about your backgrounds is because, um, aha, Radhika in education, thank you. The reason I'm asking for your backgrounds is because we probably have different experiences in our education and and those have informed the kinds of questions that we tend to see and the sorts of uses uh, the questions can be put to. Um, for example, one of my former students was from a very uh, strict cultural background in terms of teaching expectations. And when I saw that student ask questions in a classroom, they were very um, basic informational questions that weren't really intended to open up discussion or to lead to unexpected conclusions. Um, but what I've learned is that we should be open to those kinds of unexpected conclusions. Uh, so Rebecca's from nursing. Thank you. Shane uh, is here at CITL <laughs> and is connected to three faculties. That's very ambitious. Thanks, Shane. And uh, Shivam is here from the Department of Mathematics. Yes, of course. Um, good. Uh, and another from nursing. Okay, good. So we have a mixture of science backgrounds um, and then sort of pure disciplines like, like mathematics um, and, uh, and then the sort of cultural fields. Um, uh, and geographical fields. Okay, so that's good. We've got a, we've got a, a broad range here. And um, I guess that means that, yes, I do have to remind you that my background in English means that I'm a language and literary scholar and, and cultural scholar more broadly. And our classrooms have become much more conversational over the years. I've noticed this with my colleagues. I've noticed this with courses that I've uh, dropped in on over the years. Since the time I was an undergraduate student in the 1990s, um, this sort of lecture model that uh, a WebEx presentation introduces uh, is is certainly not the only model that is used successfully now and, and more commonly um, on campuses. Okay. Um, oh, and Lev, I had missed your, missed your question here, but I'd like to read it. Uh, Lev asks, how to fit this into undergraduate physics where it's easy to fall into leading questions? I'll define leading and open questions in a minute for those of you who might not be sure about them. And how to run this in large lecture sessions. I've been trying flipped classroom just in time teaching. Some students like it, a lot, a lot aren't willing or able to put in the required time. Yeah. Okay, those are great questions. And um, Part of the challenge of answer, answering them uh, relates to the challenge of teaching large, large classes, which uh, is a challenge that has these ripple effects on all the kinds of processes and procedures you can uh, undertake in the classroom, right? And it has to do with um, information management in the moment. And that's what the big challenge is. So uh, I'll say a little bit more about this in a few minutes, Lev. But um, the, the, there are two short answers. The first is it's a matter of 
um, preparing students to ask questions that are not leading questions and also to try to model questions that are open. Um, secondly, it means um, doing a bit of the prep yourself, uh, maybe creating an assignment like the one I'm about to describe that will allow you to do some of the homework so that when you come into the classroom, you've already made choices about your questions based on what students seem interested in. Uh, that's part of the flipped classroom model that Lev is talking about here. So I'll say more about this, but um, we'll do it as we go, because I think I'll probably answer parts of your questions based on the slides that I've already prepared. Yeah, so great question. And if I don't uh, remember to get back to those aspects, um, Lev, please remind me a little later. Okay, let's move on here to reasons to encourage participation. I just wanted to say something about this because um, it might not be uh, conventional wisdom that participation is helpful, but I really do think it is. There are significant advantages to participation, like the kind that questions can produce. For students, that means more motivation and interest, better critical thinking, including less rote memorization, improved communication skills, because there is some communication that they can practice in questioning and answering. And there's a growing sense of citizenship and possibly leadership. Um, and, and that's where this becomes potentially a practical, a very practical thing to consider concern yourself with. Um, so you might think, Oh, Joel teaches in, in literature. He must not be a very practical person. <laughs> I've had, I've heard that before. And although it is partly true, uh, I'm also really trying to find ways of improving my teaching year by year. Um, I'm a practical person in that sense. And uh, I know that tapping into leadership, which is really important in nursing. My sister is a nurse um, and her husband is a nurse. And it's really important to have people, especially in a trying time like this, who have leadership capabilities. It's really important in education where so much of what goes on is um, teaching for change. How do you do that? You need some people who can model that and lead it, right? Uh, and it's important in uh, any of these contexts, really. So I'm trying to focus on that, on that practical aspect today. I have a short list of disadvantages of non-participation here, but uh, you could probably expand this list dramatically. Um, it's a disadvantage uh, when non-participation leads to irresponsibility toward preparedness. Um, and, uh, and I think that also has a chilling effect on the classroom, speaking of a chilling effect from before. And naturally, um, non-participation non-participation can lead to results such as lower grades for the students. Um, and unquestionably, there's a parallel. I've done my math over the years, and I've seen how participation grades, which I'm not going to talk very much about, but how participation grades become these subjective assessments that are linked to other grades. And, uh, and this is actually another thing that goes on with the assignments that I try to to develop their assignments that are attempting to um, give students explicit ways in which they can participate in appropriate and productive ways in the classroom, whether that is in person or remote. I should say that I've done both this term with um, this assignment that I'll say more about in a moment, and it worked just as well in person as it did online. I'd like to say a little bit now about participating and leading with questions. I started with the design of an assignment that would solve the problem of a classroom centered primarily on the teacher and the lecture. I put solve and problem in quotation marks here because, uh, as I said earlier in response to, um, uh, it, it wasn't Lev, I think it was in response to Jim that um, in my experience, the lecture can reinforce a power dynamic that um, can be especially problematic when you have a, a racialized classroom or a difference between 
a white person and an indigenous person um, in the classroom, those issues become even more fraught. So um, yeah, the flipped classroom model is one of these models in which people try to move away from lectures and uh, minimize lectures, not to dispense with them altogether. I'll say more about that in a minute, but try to minimize it and introduce other ways of doing things. I just want to take a moment here to look at uh, this um, note here from Ulrika. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but you've got a great uh, message here saying, thank you for pointing out that regarding uh, leadership skills in nursing. Yeah. Um, and you're using a primarily flipped classroom, but it's always a struggle to encourage participation in this manner. Yes, I agree that it's never easy to uh, get anyone to participate in anything. <laughs> um, there are so many reasons to be reserved and to um, tune out, as they say, right? But um, but I but I can speak with confidence about the assignment I'm about to introduce to you because it worked so well for me this term, and that's why I wanted to share this with you. So my solution to this problem was specifically what I'm calling a leading by questions assignment that transforms the potential problem of a leading question into a solution that works especially well as a leadership opportunity for students with practical learning styles. Learning styles as per Sternberg and Kolb, and here I'm using the 8L, which uh, Anne Braithwaite advised against in her talk. But yes, uh, there are more people involved here other than these people who uh, are sort of name identified with these topics. But um, I break down the large list of learning styles into three main categories, creative, analytical, and practical. And they have overlap, but um, certainly um, the practical aspect, I think, is the emphasis for me right now. Jim has a question. Um, does this also reflect how we define participation? Jim, I'm a little confused about what this means in your question. I appreciate a clarification there. While Jim is is clarifying this for me, um, I'll mention that, yeah, does success ha reflect how we define participation? Yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this is a different thing that I don't need to say much about today, but um, part and parcel with this leading by questions assignment, I did another new assignment this year, which was what I called a participation worksheet so that there was no subjectivity involved um, in how I gave students grades for participation. Um, what I did is I broke down participation into three types. Um, the first type was active listening, but no speaking uh, in class, um, no verbal um, communication whatsoever, but, but maybe, you know, uh, some approvals, some nods, some smiles, some eye contact, whatever might be culturally appropriate there. I gave grades for that. Uh, I gave grades for interactions between professors and um, students in the classroom. And I gave grades for interactions between students. And I, I hated the notion of itemizing things like that. But the students really appreciated it. They said, oh, now I know that here's an appropriate thing. I can respond to a student's comment in class. And the students just didn't feel like they had that authority before. You know, for all kinds of reasons that are cultural and, and also related to their less, uh, lesser experience in the classroom. So uh, for me, um, success was people were present and they were interacting with each other on some level that um, helped to create even more participation. And it's a kind of snowball effect, right? That idea that a snowball rolling down a hill gets bigger and bigger, packing more snow onto it. That's, um, that's a good feeling to have in a classroom. 
and it's one that I hope you can work toward. But yeah, that's a great point. Um, <laughs> participation and success, those are not neutral terms, and we have to think about what those mean. So speaking of what things mean, let's talk about my terminology very briefly. A leading question is a prompt that hints at the teacher's own answer or opinion or tries to influence answers to conform to that opinion. It's often seen in binary or debate oriented prompts that seek yes or no answers. And although you can ask a lot of these on an exam or in a classroom, um, they don't move you ahead unless you have a rigid plan or let's call it a well-defined plan for where you wanna go. Um, and again, that lecture model means that you might be going in all kinds of directions that aren't really that interesting to your students. I say this partly to myself because I worry about that concern. An open question in contrast with a leading question is a prompt that seeks diverse and possibly unanticipated responses instead of a foregone conclusion as in a leading question. And they're often started with the words what, how, and why. The leading by questions assignment encourages learning by inquiry, in-class participation, and the development of leadership skills. Also, the co-creation of knowledge and a shared responsibility for education. I'll say more about that co-creation of knowledge in a bit, but I just mentioned the, the rolling snowball, <laughs> that allegory or, or metaphor, I guess, of, of how particip participation can build in a classroom. Well, um, the other really exciting thing that happens when I think everything's going really well in my classrooms is that we're creating knowledge together. We're not simply reiterating existing knowledge. Although, again, this is a disciplinary difference, right? It might be in math or it might be in chemistry that you just need students to know who Pythagoras was, or you might need them to know um, what trans is, which is the uh, the chemistry term that Anne Braithwaite mentioned. And I don't know what that means either, uh, but she mentioned it in her plenary talk this morning. So there are times when you just need a specific answer and you want to find out if students have it. Um, but uh, then you have all these potentials for uh, getting students speaking more openly about the subject matter. And, and I find that as soon as you can do that, you can help them to um, not sidestep, but sort of like it, it, it automatically deals with a lot of the minor questions and gets you focused on bigger, more important questions. Okay, another practical issue that I'll just mention briefly is that this assignment's timing is different at different portions of the course. For the first half of the course, it's about modeling the questioner. When the teacher tries to provide questions or prompts in advance, for example, in the syllabus, ask follow-up questions after initial discussion, and encourage students to ask follow-up questions as practice for the second half of the course flipping the classroom when students each write a weekly question to be discussed in class, do before class, and continue answering questions in discussion, but now mostly their questions. Um, again, this is because they're more likely to participate in the classroom if the point of the classroom is to figure out answers to questions that they have. So um, the students who, in our case, last term, it was something like 90% of the students participated in this way, they were always in class. Um, and they, they were interested in learning from each other. And I became more of a facilitator. And I've been working on that for years, but this is really the first time when it worked so well. Granted, this is a sample size of one. It's possible that I just had an amazing group of students, but I do think it has a lot to do with the structure of this assignment. Okay, so what makes a good question? And you'll see here 
um, my second poll or my second prompt for you, what one item would you add to this list? Feel free to share an item in the chat. Here's what I think makes a good question. And in fact, uh, I'll add a couple of th these things based on what Ann Braithwaite was saying earlier today. First, the answer could be important. Also, the answer is not simply yes or no, but instead it has to be elaborated. It is authentically curious, not merely a vehicle for your smart answer. It does not come out of nowhere. There is preamble and a hook, something to intrigue you, to make you interested. In the preamble or the middle of the question, there's some detail to work with. And I should say that that's because not everybody comes prepared. Um, partly for reasons that Lev mentioned, they've just got a lot of material to deal with. So if your question has something to work with in it, even people who aren't perfectly prepared might be able to participate. Finally, a good question relates to other knowledge. In my case, for example, a previous novel in one of my courses, so we can build up to it. And that also just demonstrates an interconnectivity in all knowledge. So, what one item would you add to this list? Or do you want any clarification on any of the points on this slide? I read once that people need 11, 11 seconds at minimum to answer a question. It takes that much time to remember something, recall something, formulate an answer, and then screw up the courage to say something. And uh, in the online environment, they also have to have the time to type it. <laughs> so it always takes more than 11 seconds. What one item would you add to this list of good uh, qualities of a good question? Uh, another thing that I should say while you're thinking or typing is that silence in response to a question is okay. And we shouldn't feel too uncomfortable in those silences. Silence often means that people are thinking, and that's a good thing. So uh, although I'm telling you a story to fill time here, you don't have to do that in the classroom. You can take a breather and 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 wait for people to have answers, and that's okay. Okay, Lev. Students fear of making mistakes as a result of a public education system focused on getting the correct answer. Yeah, mistakes are how we learn. Solving skills are more important than the right answer then you have to provide a curriculum based final exam. Yeah. Mm hmm. One of the concurrent questions or con 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 concurrent panels uh, this morning was on uh, unteaching. Um, and I, I think that panel would probably have something to say about um, that aspect of your interests, Lev, but I'm glad you're here in this one. Um, yeah, teaching to the exam is a problem that many of us face in our disciplines. I'm very privileged that it is not a problem that I face in literary studies and cultural studies um, that I do. So at that point, um, it's almost as if we have to redirect the questions to the administrators and to our colleagues who determine the criteria for advancement through the programs. Maybe we should be asking some pointed questions, maybe even some leading questions to our colleagues and administrators to change the structure of our education programs where that's possible. But, um, but yeah, the pressure of the right answer is something that actually prevents some people from offering the right answer, if there is a right answer, right? 
So, so changing that environment helps even the students with the right answers to speak up. And, and that's so much to do with um, trying to change the power dynamics so that students feel comfortable and, and moving a little bit farther away or minimizing the, the lecture model is one way to do that. Dr. Deshay, John here, I just wanted to point out in case you missed it, there was a comment from Jim uh, just prior to the comment from Lev on that poll question. And then there's two other comments after that as well. Okay, thanks, John. I did miss that one from Jim. Uh, Jim is talking about the other knowledge that could include experience and culture. Yeah, so what makes a good, good, a good question, um, it could elicit um explanations of experience and culture and and validate experience and culture i think that's good um very helpful that's one of the things that in fact helps to create the environment where a student will feel allowed to give even the right answer <laughs> right if that student's feeling pressure about like even saying something uh in in a, in a room um, Shane, Shane says, rather than add to this list, I'd like to emphasize the importance of preamble and how much I personally enjoy scaffolding for learning and reflecting in my own learning while being an education student. I feel like gaps as a result of a lack of explicit reference to a previous topic or prereq are major barriers to giving an appropriate answer. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, so putting emphasis on preamble is important. And in your case, you're talking about preamble that is sort of uh, in the prerequisites, you know, before the course. Yeah. In other words, engage students previous knowledge and experience, right? With and Braithwaite talking about citations, um, it made me remember that um, once in a while I get an expert on something in my classrooms. You know, I had a student once who was a, a, a semi pro hockey player. And uh, I asked the student to cite something like, that's a really obscure historical reference to the development of rules in hockey. How on earth could you possibly know that? You must be like plagiarizing somebody. And the student's like, no, I'm a semi-pro player. Like, <laughs> hockey's my life. <laughs> and so uh, finding a way to validate that student's previous experience, even before my course, can help to give that student a legitimate voice in the classroom, right? And and that's when students feel more comfortable answering your questions. Yeah, so that's a great point, Shane. Thanks very much. Radhika's question is really important. How to prepare a comfortable environment for the students to come up with their answers? Yeah, it's the big question about safe spaces, right? That's part of what it is. Students, have to feel like they can be listened to, right? Um, and I'm trying to model this here, uh, and John has been helping. Um, we try not to, to ignore people who have questions um, because it, it can actually become strategic to ignore people who have questions if the same hand is always going up in the classroom or if somebody's jumping in all the time. Those kinds of ways of dominating the discussion um, reduce other students' level of comfort. But, um, you know, uh, I think, Radhika, it has something to do with how you set the tone, um, how everybody sets the tone. It's not only the instructor's responsibility. Sometimes you can just have a group that's not gonna be that helpful. But um, often, if you set a tone of, of modeling friendliness and um, openness, um, that, means that a lot of students are going to to follow that model. They actually feel empowered by that model, I think, to be friendly and open. Sometimes students still have this high school mentality of opposing the authority figures, but if you can, um, maybe with, I often use self-deprecation, I make jokes about myself sometimes, it's a, a way of diffusing my authority and just sitting down and talking with them uh, chatting with them before the class begins, things like that can be really helpful to create that environment. And then the questioning and answering just goes a little more smoothly.
And we have one more uh, comment from Ulrika Pai. Uh, relevant to practice was her comment with regards to your question. And I will just uh, let you know that there's 15 minutes left in the session. Thanks, John. Yeah, I missed that one about the relevant to practice. Um, but, but I think that's helpful. Uh, a reminder that a good question is practical. Uh, it's involved in the processes that we go through. Um, so I'm going to show you in just a moment um, some samples from my syllabus. Now, again, it's in a literature context, but I can say a little bit about the practice that we're involved in, and you can figure out whether you can adapt this for your own purposes. So this is a sample prompt from my own syllabus while we were studying Leonard Cohen's book, Death of a Ladies' Man. Twenty odd years after Let Us Compare Mythologies and its theme of paternal relationships, the speaker is now a father himself. In poems such as Another Family, The Promise, The Other Village, and especially Beside My Son, what seems to have changed since Let Us Compare Mythologies? How is the father represented now? So, um, this goes back to Radhika's most recent question. How do you make a comfortable environment? Um, these comparative questions are very easy for students. Compare and contrast is what they've been taught from elementary school through high school. So giving them something comparative helps them to achieve a certain amount of comfort. Uh, this is still a, a difficult question, partly because it's pretty open. But one of the reasons why it works is because if I, answer, if I ask this question in class, and it's in the syllabus so they know it's coming on that day of class, if I ask the question and I wait 11 seconds, <laughs> make a few jokes, and, and still no one has anything, I say, well, let's just look at one of those poems. What do I feel like reading today? I think I'm going to read the one called Beside My Son. That poem happens to be five lines long, it's really short. So you can read it five times if you want, and then you can talk about it. And you can redirect students back to these questions. Um, so this question worked really well, this term. It's really open, it's comparative. Both of those things um, can help when you're asking questions. Now, by the way, I'm going to uh, ask you at the end to comment on some of these prompts if you'd like. Um, there's kind of a narrative for how these prompts fit together, uh, but if you do wanna just jump in with a question about these prompts or a comment about them as we go, that's okay. I can also take your criticisms. If you think that these are bad prompts, <laughs> you can tell me why and I'd be happy to respond. So I've said a little bit about this one. I wanna move on to another one, keeping in mind what John said about time. This one is notable for its deliberate binary debate point of departure. So yes, this one is a leading question, but I'll tell you a little bit more about why it worked. Near the end of the book, we're also talking about Death of a Ladies Man by Leonard Cohen. This postmodern self-reflexivity culminates in a series of poems about Cohen's anesthetics, including Which is So Beautiful, The Price of This Book, The Transmission, My Life in Art, and How to Speak Poetry. Have you? been anesthetized as the speaker warned? Have you been seduced into his arms? What do you think? How do you feel? Why? I wanted to include this prompt because yeah, there is a leading question built in here. Have you been anesthetized? It's easy for a student to say, no, done, move on, right? But it's also um, a provocative question. And I hope that, because I don't dwell on it, the open questions that come later um, can get students thinking about why they might have been provoked, why they would feel um, stuck by a yes, no uh, question or the expectation of a yes, no question. So, Every rule can be broken. You can use a leading question, but if you do, I recommend that you open it up afterwards because you can just say yes or no, and you have to make sure that 
the elaboration can continue. So these are two samples from me, but I want to show you a couple samples from students because I hope you'll be, well, I don't know how you'll feel. I hope you'll be impressed by what students came up with in this course. This, by the way, is a course that had mostly third year undergraduate students in it. Here's one of theirs. It's about the book Warlight by Michael Ondaatje. Michael Ondaatje's Warlight contains many instances of nicknaming. For example, the children's mother nicknames them Stitch and Wren. Most prominently, the children nickname their caregivers the Moth and the Darter. While not as traditional, this mimics the way we nickname our parents, Mom and Dad. Note particularly the starting letter of each nickname. What is the significance of these names? How do these particular nicknames enforce or go against the concept of a nuclear family? Yeah, so you might realize that this is totally one of those, I have a secret answer <laughs> kind of questions, right? Um, the answer is kind of built into this one. Uh, what is the significance of these names? Well, the moth means mother and the darter means dad or father. How do these particular nicknames enforce or go against the concept of a nuclear family? Well, those people aren't the actual parents, so it's dissolving the nuclear family and producing an alternative arrangement. So the question has already answered itself. This was early in the, in the term. Students were still warming up. I didn't want to suppress the question. I actually brought it into the classroom and commented on it much as I'm doing now because it's a great idea. In fact, I cited this student's anonymous question in uh, an essay I just wrote about this novel, which uh, I hope will be published in, a, in an upcoming book. So I was fascinated by it and I wanted to bring it into the classroom, but this is also something that meant that I'm going to deal with this question pretty quickly. We'll spend five minutes on it instead of 15 minutes, right? Now here's a final example for my students. This is after they'd been practicing. In Dion Brand's novel, Theory, we come to know the narrator through the way that they think about their partners and what they imagine their partners think of them. Here, the narrator is using a plural pronoun because it's ambiguous um, how the gendering of the narrator proceeds throughout the book. When the narrator reminisces on their time dating Yara, they associate Yara and her way of living with fire. Yara is always on fire, burning, burning, burning. Her urgent manner is an incinerator that burns the narrator up, and she attracts emergencies like a fire department. The narrator associates Yara with passion, but also destruction, just like a fire. If Yara was the narrator of theory, what natural element might she use to shape our image of the current narrator and why? This question worked really well in the classroom. It's partly because it's asking students to be really creative, right? It's a counterfactual question. Um, Yara was not the narrator of this novel. So in some ways you can just say, well, it's not factually correct. But as soon as you start to imagine what would happen if Yara was the narrator, um, people have lots of interesting things to say about the actual facts of the book. So just because the question is providing an alternative universe of sorts doesn't mean it can't connect to the actuality of the subject matter. Um, these kinds of what if um, questions are fantastic and I highly recommend building some of them into your own questioning techniques. I had mentioned that this is a question or an assignment that's really helpful for students with practical learning styles, but it's questions like this that show how students with creative learning styles can really find a place in um, a questioning, uh, a creative questioning scheme. Okay, well, we now have some time for further discussion. We've not a lot of time, we have something like five minutes. Um, what are your views of the prompts that I shared? Why and how do you use questions in your teaching? If you're not in the humanities, how would you adapt the leading by questions assignment to your discipline? For example, social work or engineering. 
I'd love to hear your views on this. Shabam says, here's a question about delivery. In a class, would you normally present the follow-up right along with a yes, no leading question or wait for the response to the leading question before opening up with a follow-up? Yeah, that's a great practical question. Usually I would put it all on the same slide, um, but as you saw, sometimes I uh, blank out the bottom of a slide and, and talk just about a few things and then let the remainder of the slide come in later. You could do that with uh, a leading question that transforms into an open question. And in fact, I've seen that done in uh, conferences. Uh, there was this great con conference presentation that had text that would sort of come in uh, bit by bit and, and sort of assemble um, from being invisible to being visible throughout the course of um, the discussion of the question. And it worked great. So yeah, I would put it on the same slide and not worry about it because some students will just skip over the leading part of the question and go right to the to the open part anyway. Um, but it could it could work either way. I've seen it work either way. Just so I can demonstrate um, an important uh, questioning technique, I just want to follow up there. Uh, Shivam, is that uh, an acceptable answer to you or, or would you like some more um, thoughts about that? Okay, it seemed to satisfy the, the question, so that's good. Jim points out the leading question assignments uh, similar to the reflection assignments related to experiences in practice or with elders and professionals. And thank you, Rebecca, for responding to Jim directly. Uh, that's great, I love it when that happens. We have the same types of reflective assignments in nursing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question about reflection. Um, what's the benefit of reflection for you, Jim, or for you, Rebecca? One of the first assignments in my courses this term, this past term, was a self-reflective plan assignment where students commented on their own educational journey and where they wanted to go with it last term. And um, that's just a way of my saying, yes, I think that reflection is so important. But what's so good about it? Rebecca says it has an impact on self-awareness and learning for the student. It's about their growth. Yeah, that's what I think it is. Um, self-awareness is one of the big steps toward knowledge. When you, when you know what your own strengths and weaknesses, opennesses and biases are, you're much better equipped to learn because you can deal with some of the um, in psychology, it's called interference in educational psychology, interference, things that interfere with what you learn. Self-reflection helps you to get past that. And Jim says, reflection allows the student to personalize and become self-aware as it supports learning and growth. Yeah. Yeah, and now, you know, um, exactly. Uh, Rebecca's saying, how would this work in an anatomy and physiology class? Uh, that's tricky. Um, self-awareness uh, and personalization also open up the door to problems of subjectivity, right? And I think back to that person who didn't want to read Walter Bateman's book open to question because it was too self-indulgently subjective. Um, but listen, um, people are more open to learning objective things if they can see their own personal connections to those things, right? Um, 
Yeah, and and Jim's follow up here that it it helps people to learn from their other experiences is so true. Yeah, you know, anatomy and physiology. Um, not everybody has the same anatomy. Uh, so there are sort of objective realities of uh, uh, standardization for humans, but there are there's lots of diversity, and and so getting people to talk about. Um, those things makes a difference. Um, I play music, so <laughs> one of the funny things that the guys often talk about is the size of their hands. Well, because it makes a difference to certain um, musical instruments that you might play. Uh, a a long-scale scale, long scale bass guitar compared to a sh short-scale six-string guitar, for example, right? So, so getting in touch with those um, personal reflections just uh, helps to situate learners in the context of other things that need to be learned that might be considered more objective um and then they're more more, more motivated to make those connections and i think that's really important and helpful